right? So, like I said, this is about semantics. And these semantics might be like, not what you learn in the linguistics course, because they're based on more mathematical concepts. So, first, something about myself. I'm um, not only really come from a linguistic background, much as I come from a computer science and mathematical background, and that's really a big influence for, for this language. The other really big influence is, I'm sure you've all heard of the Lojban, which is, of course, logical language. And therefore, this language is also kind of like a logical language, but there are some differences. So here's a simple example sentence from that, and this is a script written below it, and here's a phrase. This is actually a translation of this is an example sentence written in that. It was basically developed whenever I was bored in this Greek mathematics course, which is explaining a lot about how it works. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so just before we begin, I need to gauge this general knowledge, because I'm not sure what background most of you come from, except for obviously most of our amateur linguists. So we all familiar with the idea of set theory, like what a set is, the conclusion, Union. Okay, that's good. And then just another idea. Does everybody know what reverse Polish notation is? No. Okay. Well, you don't need to know, that's you know it. Same thing with lambda functions. I'm sure most of you probably at least heard of lambda functions. Well, you won't need to understand them intuitively, but we will use them. So now that you understand, more people know. Uh, with those some extent, you know that is the language we're talking about. In the context of this speech, it's only a tool. You can use this with any syntactic structure. You can use this by making the language anywhere. So we can like flip word over around. But it is a tool we're using, so we're going to have to understand a little bit about how the language works before we begin. So linguistically, it's hard to apply the linguistic term to that just because the way the language actually forms, because of the semantics that we use, are so unique. Uh, but we can roughly say that it's an area language, right? Uh, strongly had final, so everything comes to the end. It's, and, uh, it's isolational, so every word's individual, which is important because these represent functions over sets. And then the word one is SOB. It makes sense because, like I said, we know the word bullet notation, so then you heard fit. So you have an idea there. Uh, this is phonology. It's basically English and tricks because, you know, Bell Trick is the coolest thing ever. And also, uh, so you can read IPA, you can basically read the transcription, because I don't deviate too much from it, except for maybe with A versus A. And the cool thing about that, and which makes it different from a lot of languages, and this is a very big Lojuan influence, is that instead of having nouns and verbs separate things, they're kind of the same thing dotted. So we have omta. Omta are our base set. They're pronouns, articles, and proper nouns only. Notice the typical nouns are opus, and unfortunately, this... <coughs> I don't know why that is. I'm sorry it's getting cut off. Um, anyway, they're pushed, if you know anything about reverse polarization. Then we have opus sums, on the other hand, they're kind of cut off. They're at they're the rest of the thing. They're adjective verbs, closed positions. And you can recognize them because they always start with vowels, or omta always start with nouns. So it's easy to recognize things. Because this is kind of a logical language, and these parts are done in Every sentence has exactly one parts. And finally, for reverse polish, people who know reverse polarization, these are operators. They're pop and then push. And they can either pop one or two things, and that depends on their conjugation. This is the only conjugation and morphological structure in the language, which is uh, you can make a verb transitive versus the default form is intransitive by assimilating nasal to the first constant in the opus. Now remember opus being with vowels, so the first constant won't be in the first letter. So if we have a word like al palm, the uh, assimilation would be al palm. And there's a group of constants that we just ignore, and another group that we have to assimilate by putting an L in front because we can't assimilate a nasal to them because they already are nasal words. Uh, okay. So, again, it's kind, of a, it's kind of a different language, but we have the basic structure, which is kind of like a clause. But I use different words in the Lujbonic tradition, so we don't confuse them with the connotations we typically use in those things. So they are called EP. Eplead are basically any collections, and then you can turn put Eplead into other opus to make new Eplead. So we have Hamishik is one, and then Hamishik goes into Arad to form new Eplead, Hamishik Arad. Same thing with Let Alton. And then you notice in K is kind of conjugated, but we have assimilated um to K. And then that would take both of these arguments off stack and create a new argument. And if any of you know this, this basically looks like an S, S expression in reverse. And finally, there are 10 structure words. We will only be able to cover seven of them, and that's even if we have time. All right, so now we have to be perfect at them, right? We can read that sentence. <laughs> <laughs> now, we need to go back to some more basics. So here's the idea of set semantics inside data versus maybe more intuitive 
thing to think about. So cumulus, as we know, when we talk, we like to tell stories. We like to explain how things happen. Sue went to the store, then she picked up the oranges, and she went home. That one doesn't work like this. Instead, it explains what you want people to pay attention to, not how that thing actually happened. And we do this by specifying the specific set we want people to look at. So, to explain the story, let's tell a little story. We have Bob, and we have Sue, and they're walking through a forest, but all of a sudden, Oh my goodness, the board of hydra appears. <laughs> All right. So, Bob sees this poorly drawn hydra, and his own semantic space, his own conceptualization of reality, he has a set which corresponds to this type. And he kind of draws a circle around it, and then he uses this circle to be able to form a set. And he uses the language in order to specify a specific set which refers to all possible types. He then sends this message over to Sue, and Sue hears these words, and these words to her create a different semantic set, which may or may not correspond to her own understanding of the tiger, but it intersects with it slightly. And then she understands the tiger. And then, in the spirit of uh, neural networks, they've been well programmed, and they say tiger, they should run. Because <laughs> it's a tiger. And, well, Bob Sue went this, and unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> But the idea I want to get to here, and the whole point of the story, was I want to explain the idea that what Bob was doing here was he's explaining a set of tigers. He was telling Sue, I want you to pay attention to this tiger, instead of saying, there is a tiger, telling a story about the tiger. So let's start building some sets, because that's how we talk about things in Dalai. These are the basic parts, the long tail, like I said before. And we have three basic categories that we talk about. Unfortunately, some of them have cut off yet. Uh, First, we have pronouns, and you might think of pronouns like one thing, and I said things are sets, right? Well, I don't want to think of it like a single thing now. When I say I, I'm talking about me now, all the means of the past, all the potential means of the future, all the potential means of the past, the whole gigantic set. General, if you want to have an omta, it should be a very big set. Also, articles, which may be strange to think of articles as like basic building blocks, almost like whenever I gloss uh, the word omta, I gloss it as now. Um, but that's indeed how it works. So we have let and hum, which are very common, and unfortunately we won't be able to get to the tools we need to understand war, which is the all. So let is a particular thing in context that I'm talking about. So if I'm pointing to something and talking about it, instead of it being a demonstrative, a demonstrative would call the pronoun. So let or this is a demonstrative of the short range demonstrative pronoun. We have let or a particular thing I'm talking about, or hum is just anything in context. So it has been a very gigantic, large set. And finally, we have names, and names are things we use to refer to specific things. <coughs> yeah, they're very interesting to create language. Oh, very nice. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and again, remember, they all have to start with constants. So if we have a, a loan word, we have to make sure to put a constant in front of it. So we can't say Austin. And typically, the constant I use is B. But if we put B in front of Austin, we get an entirely different city. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is good and all, but just saying let or just saying exactly doesn't tell the person much information, right? So we have to filter this down, make the meaning more specific, and we do this with intransitive focus. So we, so we start out with our basic set the, right? And then we, we uh, iterate over using the predicate type, and this is called in set theory comprehension. So we're comprehending over all the possible values of let and only picking up the ones that. Uh, satisfy the tiger predicate, or our tiger. And of course, the way E3 work, this forms a sentence, and then we can form this, take this set here, and plug it into another set formula here. So now, a rod means big, so now we're filtering all the things out of tigers that are also big, so we're talking about the big tiger, because that's the set that we specified. But unfortunately, this again only gets us so far. Right, we can specify that I'm a goer, we can talk all about the means that are going, and we can talk about Austin as a destination, but that doesn't specify a relationship between the two. We, there's no just re reason to imply that I am actually going to Austin. So fortunately, as we've already seen, we can make opus transit. In fact, all of us are the finest way if you actually look at a dictionary. And when you look at the dictionary, it will all the all the opuses will be defined this way, in terms of het and ye. So het is kind of like the subject or the object. And then he is the active form. Because remember, we're in narrative language. And uh, this is just a gloss. So, for example, we have heck is a tiger filtered by the fifth breed. 
and we have a ride half as big as the mean. By the way, when we see mounts, you typically see them find this way as a comparative. And finally, the EK, which is the relationship we want, it talks about the bell and where they're going. So we have to increase our model for comprehension now, right? We have to iterate over both of the inquiries that are passed in, in this case, both the Yonka, which is Bob and Austin, which is what we refer to as Austin. And you notice, and this is what I mean by arrogant, and this is why I say arrogant is probably a poor description if you're used to the linguistic tradition of the word. But we're used to Bob escaping, right? Because Bob was the goer before. But now uh, we're not talking about Bob whenever we use the transit form of the verb. We're talking about the destination, because that's what escapes. So A are all the things that are Austin, B are all the things that are Bob, and then we're talking about the relationship where Bob goes to A, and we want to talk about those types of Austins. But, all of our uh, focuses are defined transitively. So what was actually happening with hand Because this model th disagrees, right? We can't take a binary predicate and then just make it unary. We have to parameterize it, and we parameterize it with context. So again, when we talk about something, there's always a context that we to communicate the discussion. And that's what we do to talk about what Tiger we're talking about. So there's some breed of Tiger in context that whenever we talk about the Tiger, Implied. And we use this a lot, so we read the way just using a capital C. We should understand that we're actually still iterating over two sets. Also, we have to understand that every sentence after it's said is intersected with context. So even if we specify a really big set of tigers, like Hung El Alter, then you iterate, talk about, you think of the only ones they want to talk about. Because remember, these are really big sets. All right. so. Here's a more complicated example so we can see all of these things working together. We have, and if you also notice, this is the sentence we diagram at the beginning of the presentation. So, Hamishikawa is the big rock. Right? So here's some more definitions. And that's this step here, right? So this C is a B, and this B is the filter from this uh, big, and that's a C cut off. And then A is the set from our sum. So we have some things, that something has to be a rock, and of those some rocks, they have to be bigs. And that's what we get for C, and then we put it into uh, Go. And Go has another argument, that's the cat, the Tom. So then we have all of this sentence basically means we're talking about a big rock that a cat goes to, or English, we would more say probably the cat goes to the big rock. So fortunately, unfortunately, we have to extend the model a little bit more to uh, account for some even more complicated opus, though so you don't actually have to use this full generalization very often. Typically, the simple comprehension over binary predicate is enough. But for certain words, for example, or, if we find more in this language as a union, we have to be able to talk about function from sets to sets, because if you notice, comprehension is a narrowing procedure, but a union has to necessarily grow the number of sets, so we can't use comprehension for everything. But typically, uh, this functional relationship, we're not actual functions, they're just func uh, a functional relationship. Uh, we can use the identity function and then only have the identity function tuples in the set such that uh, it, mess, it filters the meaning that we want from the two elements of the relationship. So again, unfortunately, this makes comprehension almost unreadably complex. So this is a simple step we looked at earlier, right? Just one simple thing we're dealing under, and then this has to be the full formula. So basically, we have to just specify that there exists some sets, such these are inside of the sets, and then it gets really complicated. So why would we go through all this complication? Why can't we just remove those little ugly parts of the language and uh, use the nice, more convenient comprehension? Well, it turns out that it's really useful for some other grammatical features, such as we want to sometimes talk about the other thing, right? So we have to swap around arguments. Uh, we use s or ens to do this. Uh, ens changes the uh, image of a function. So typically in the case of transitivity, which is there, we choose the second thing, we choose either J or H. Or with S, we flip it around so we can change the argument direction. Now, I'm not going to get into too much detail because I'm worried about time. And then we can do this for onto for uh, transitive relation, intransitive relationships as well. But you notice whenever we use F ends, which takes the second thing out, we're actually not getting contextualization of a verb. So when we talk about a sheep means rock, so when we talk about the empty sheep, we're not talking about the rock, we're talking about the contextualized material that the rock's made out of. So another thing that's really useful, and something you cannot speak that in without, is a raised phrase. So we can talk, we can use relationships, right? We can talk about things that are cats, 
thing where you talk about something that goes to something else. We can't talk about the relationship themselves. And the way we do that is by using a raised phrase. We raise the phrase out of the actual meaning. Uh, this is a lot similar to the nest uh, suffix in English. So we're talking about catness or goingness or bigness. And we do this using lambda functions. I told you they show up. So now, those of you who know a little bit about Lojman, this is kind of like a Kai abstraction, which we have both binary and unary. If you don't understand what that is, don't worry about it. Um, and this, these turn into, I say Anka here, but more accurately, the um, And basically, we, we select all these things out of the set, and we talk about being that thing, right? So the lambda function will plug in here and give us the truth. Is this thing or is this not this thing? And now we're talking about the miss of it, right? We've created a new kind of predicate out of old words. And the two words we use are ed, which is just for a single word, because the words happen so often. And also, we can use a whole phrase, such as up lab up is the uh, structure we use. We can use that with up lab alter lab up, which is big tigerness, right? So we're talking about the property of the tiger being big, not an actual big tiger. Uh, we can also use this for uh, relationship, which by you should use add, you just use the transitive form of the verb. Or you have to use um, but you can use a raised phrase with two arguments, right? Because we need to warn the speaker about what's going to come up. We are slightly unambiguous. Well, completely unambiguous. And this talks about relationships. So now we're not talking about something that goes to another thing. We're talking about the general relationship between the going and the destination, or the general relationship between a rock goer and the rock that they're going to. And you'll notice that. Inside the structure, we use law, het, and ye, and these satisfy our, our morphological constraints for onto and that's exactly all they are. They're nothing more complicated than a simple onto And they all privileges the regular onto do. You can use them anywhere within the reason, and you can use them inside the principal sentence itself. In fact, that's exactly how you ask questions. You put in a lambda uh, relation that you want the user, to, the listener, to fulfill back to you, right? So if you just say, I'll come, that creates a lambda function because you can admit it. And then you're asking the user for, well, what's a cat, right? Give, give me a set that fills in the definition of a cat. And as I said, you can omit those too, so you don't have to talk as much. If they're the first element, if they're not the first uh, part of a phrase, you can't omit it. That's just a small little grammatical quirk. Again, Dobbins, Dobbins is the tool we're using, but it's not the tool you have to use for this semantic structure. All right. Well, like we said, everything in this language has to be a set. So we have to have a, fun a set interpretation for what these raisins actually are. And it turns out that they're actually the exact same interpretation we use for the full model for opus. We're creating a list of uh, tuples that may define our function. But the difference is that before, if you used an opus, you actually had to apply the opus to arguments. Now we're able to talk about the relationship itself. We reify the relationship. And even unary work the exact same way. We just create an identity function here, so we do the same thing. So even if you use S and you flip it around, you're going to have to talk have to the same thing. So it's a lambda function in one variable instead of two, though it's still technically two. And so how can we use this? Like, when would this actually be useful in language? And one way we can use it is for adverbs. And we have two words that we use for turning these relationships into adverbs. We're not going to talk about A, but we'll talk about yields. Yields allows us to take a raising and then reapply it to an argument. So we see here, any k is the lambda function of going, and then epis is the word for fast. fast. So then we're describing going fast, right? Because this is a set. This is the set relationship going fast, and we only want the relation for it going fast. And then we take this lambda function and we reapply it to our original monster, which is a leading range monster. So there goes quickly, or he goes quickly. Uh, honestly, this is a bit of a contrived example. You probably just say your DK at this because then we just narrow the things that are going and the things that are fast, which basically means the same thing. However, there are more complicated sentences where you actually need to do this. Another example, and the point of the speech, is you can use this to define new words within the language itself. Because when we specify a relationship here, for example, this is the definition of conline written inside that in itself, right? We're talking about a language that is created by someone. And then we quote the word, and then we use the definition of the word itself, which takes a relationship and a word and relates them, right? So we relate the O, L, she, you, and then with this raising, which is a lambda function of two variables, so we have this is the language, that is the person who makes it, and so now we have a new word, conline, which is a relationship between the language and the person who made it. 
And there's a lot more, but unfortunately, I'm going to have to stop here because of time. Uh, if you're ever curious, there's, this set of semantics affects a very common linguistic structure in an interesting way. For example, lists and numbers are actually the same thing in this language. Tense is, of course, a, a, just a filtering. And we have logic and negation, interesting things. And of course, we've already talked about questions. Uh, now, this may seem really a complicated way to actually think about a language. Why would you, how do you teach someone this if they didn't speak the language before? This is uh, the hard way to learn. Like, I read a book once, it's called Math Max the Hard Way, which started out with like uh, piano axioms and all that really complicated stuff, and then eventually did with addition with like, like really page 50. And this is kind of the same treatment for that, right? We're, we're not, this is actually how you teach someone that, and you can teach them intuitively, but it does explain some oddities, and it uh, shows how you can use a logical structure inside the language. So just a quick review, we talked about declarative semantics, right? So we're talking about what, not how, so what happens. And then we uh, filter specific meanings out of it, and we make these uh, filters even more precise by talking about relations. Then once we notice that functions are indeed sets, we can raise them into separate phrases, and we can use these relations to talk about relations themselves. All right, so I'm not sure how much time we have for questions, but I'm going to use this. Any questions? No? Questions. Questions. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, to what degree do you think you could describe a map lane in the same sort of a framework? It would seem like the reverse would be mostly true with a few exceptions that you mentioned, like you just said. So, could you take the same sort of logical framework and describe a map lane using that? Um, which way are we going? We're describing uh, these things with using that line, or we're describing a that line using the relationships? Describing a that line using the logic, uh, logical framework that you built this language in. That's an interesting question. I'd be willing to say yes, but it's one of those things I wouldn't want to answer until I actually tried to do it. <laughs> um, just. Uh, with regard to the parser you showed, uh, I guess it's all supposed to be unambiguously parsable. Is that kind of clear from what you set up? Like which pairs of words I associate first? Uh, if, if, if I have a string of words, I, I you know, do some function compositions and intersections of sets and so forth, or not compositions, but intersections of sets and so forth. But in what order? How, what's the syntax? Um, it is. What's the syntax? Uh, it's basically. The, I actually wrote a program that parses it. Uh -huh. um, and the way it works is you look for things, and if they start with a consonant, or if they're one of those structured words, you can do the structure. Uh -huh. And you just pop, if they're on the. Oh, but you did say, you did say. It's the, it's, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Um, this is the last quick one here. If you were willing to refer to cat ness ness, <laughs> would it be just too abstract, or would that have to shift to the other marker? Or? You would use eel. Um, if you don't mind, I can write it over here. Oh. oh, this is a permit. That's Let's see. So you would talk about. And then we talk about uh, Edward Tom, his cadence, right? And then we apply it. Right, so we, this is the cadence, right? And then this is the property of applying cadence to something else. So this is cadence ness. Okay, well, uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, Zachary. <laughs>